Hello class, welcome back. Uh, this is part three of theories. So today we're going to present uh, the Margaret Mead and Derek Friedman controversy. Um, and just a reminder of Margaret Mead. Uh, she was a student of Boas um, from the 1920s. In 1928, she set out uh, to the islands of Samoa and worked with teenage girls. Uh, her book, Coming of Age of Samoa, uh, was very popular and um, and really had an influence in many movements, social movements here in the U.S. Um, now, again, I always have to remind you, we have to understand what was uh, what was taking place at the time, at, of Mead's time. She was living in a time of segregation, uh, eugenics. Uh, segregation was where they would divide people, separate but equal, um, People could not use, uh, attend the same schools, uh, sit in the same sections, use the same restrooms, and equality was not um, applied. But, and the idea of separating people based on their features, this idea of race created ideas of racism, um, and so forth. So, also, during the time, uh, you had a, an extensive lecture on um, on the origins of racism and also eugenics. Remember, in, in the 30s, there were scientific experiments um, how, to, how to do pretty much selective breeding, how to uh, eliminate um, humans that they would consider to be deficient in some way, um, in some way or another, whether they thought it was a mental uh, defici deficiency or physical, um, there, this was a time when the U.S. was receiving a lot of immigrants, and they would they would do tests such as measuring the size of their bodies, the size of their of their heads, and so forth, uh, putting categorizing people on their physical characteristics and assuming. Um, that we could create uh, and achieve a, a perfect human race. And these were ideas, of course, borrowed from, from other, other uh, countries and other scientists, and nonetheless, they were being applied here in the US. So in this time, there's a lot of turmoil going on, a lot of division um, that we could see um, being carried out um, among among society here in the U.S. So when Margaret Mead set out uh, to do her study, she was, again, 23 years old, and she was going against this idea that science um, was, um, was revealing how certain, you know, uh, hierarchical structures on how to organize people, like from ideas from social Darwin, from Herbert Spencer, um, ideas of some people, especially non-European people, uh, were considered primitive. And, and this idea, the scientific um, th hypothesis that teenagers just, you know, it's inevitable here in the U.S., they just undergo such turmoil, uh, Margaret Mead set out to study another culture to apply, apply this hypothesis and to see if this was if this was correct, and her findings uh, reveal that among Samoa teenage girls, and that she interviewed, and they did not display this this rebellious attitude and this undergo such turmoil, emotional turmoil, as the kids in the U.S. were were going through. And she also noticed um, that they were not raised just by their parents. They were raised by the community. So there were multiple adults always kind of supervising children. And in this, in this uh, way, young girls had freedom. Had, they had agency. They had freedom over their bodies. They had freedom to move around, freedom to make decisions. And in these decisions, uh, during this time of, uh, of adolescence, they had sexual freedom, a sexual freedom that was not viewed as, as something negative, as taboo, and it would not affect their ability to get married. 
And this, in, in this, with this information, uh, again, it's in nineteen in the nineteen late nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties, early nineteen thirties. This information was um, was controversial. At this time, there was a change going on in in society here in the U.S. Um, over five million men were were at, were called upon to go to war. And women had to go to the factories to work. So the social role for women was changing. They were entering a working environment. They were now wage earners. Uh, their gender roles were changing. They were fighting for their rights and also uh, start reclaiming their rights over their bodies, rights over over you know how they from how they should dress and what they could do with their bodies, and so forth. And at this time. Um, Margaret Mead's work not only inspired um, many of these movements uh, from the women's movements to um, to social equality uh, for minorities, um, but also inspired what was take what was the seeds of the countercultural revolution that would take place in the '60s. So, from this, let me go to our slide so I can introduce um, what's what this film is about and how this controversy. Okay, so after um, Margaret Mead became one of the most influential women in the U.S. and she received this recognition, she worked with the government, she worked with many universities, um, set up multiple museums, and, and just made a lot of contribution in academia. Um, in the 60s, from the 60s, the inspired by this countercultural revolution emerged this idea of postmodernism and deconstruction. And, and academics in this time uh, from begin to question everything. Is there an absolute truth? Is, is, or is everything... Um, you can we interpret and deconstruct everything? So there's there's kind of like an argument of going against structuralism, as kind of Levi Strauss pointed out. That this is the way, regardless of what culture you're in and what sign, what symbols you you learn, this is the way the brain works. There's a structure. There's a hierarchical structure and how ideas are organized. And therefore, if you are part of this culture, you would know the meaning. To, ev to everything within the culture. And so these studies, when applied to anthropology, begin to deconstruct um, these, these ideas of structuralism and um, this, this idea of, you know, this is the way it is across the board for everyone in the culture. And deconstruction notions of, of theories uh, come about to say, well, um, even within a culture, no two people see the see everything the same way. Not even two people in the family, raised by the same family, see things the same way. So in order for us to be able to understand this and be able to understand what's going on in the culture, we must focus on uh, we must go focus on the individual and be able to deconstruct um, how they are viewing the symbols, how they are interpreting these symbols to be able to arrive at, at a meaning. So from, from this idea, arguing that there is no truth, um, and many people view the world, every individual views the world differently, um, these type of studies bring about this notion to deconstruct former theories, deconstruct former works, especially people that were very famous, as in the case of Margaret Mead. And during this time, it was called the period of re-studies. And, um, and a, an academic by the name of Derek Friedman um, took it upon himself to debate, to to go to the Samoa Islands and see if what Margaret Mead, this famous work, if that was actually true. And 
if there's going to be some some debates with this i want you to keep this in mind when friedman finally published his book this was in 83 this is about 50 50 some years 58 years later than margaret mead published her work uh friedman was friedman being a male um middle-aged male when he carried out this work, he also uh, was able to establish um, a high-ranking uh, position within within the culture, within Samoa, and he worked with the high-ranking officials. So his interviews were dealing were were more among the high-ranking officials and among men. Um, so I want you to pay attention. I'm going to present the film, and it's going to provide the the background and give you a visual of the debate that took place because this became a very famous debate it was in newspapers um it was it was um what he and just what his title says the making and unmasking of an anthropological myth um so he is really um questioning margaret mead's um findings and Calling, calling her work kind of like this myth that she created. Um, and it had this big influence in the U.S. So I'll come back to this debate um, after the film. Oh, excuse me a second. Let me go back to this and put the film on. And she said to me, would you like to be famous? And I said, uh, no, I really wouldn't. And she said, you know, she said, uh, you're very wise, you know. She said, it's cost me a lot. All those awful hotels, the traveling, and the loneliness. And she said, the days are all right. You're surrounded with all kinds of people. But the nights are so lonely, and it is so terrible. And that was one of the times where I felt very close to her indeed and knew that she really paid a terrible price. But I don't think she would have done it differently if she had to do it all over again. I think she enjoyed what she was able to accomplish. In November of 1978, Margaret Mead dies. According to a poll, she's one of the three best-known women in American history. Internationally celebrated, she had become, in the words of Time magazine, mother to the world. The book that has made her famous is Coming of Age in Samoa, on which she begins work at the age of 23. In it, she announces her sensational discovery of a Polynesian culture free of the stresses of adolescence, a place of free love and harmony. Here, children sail painlessly and effortlessly into adulthood in a lush tropical setting. The book becomes a classic and has a profound effect on future generations of Americans who strive to emulate its findings. In 1940, another 23-year-old, Derek Freeman, arrives in Samoa aboard a banana boat out of Wellington, New Zealand. He is a fervent believer in Mead's Samoa, whose account he has read and reread. He's taking up his new post as a school teacher in Apia. Awaiting him, he is sure, is the island paradise whose description has so captivated him. But instead, he finds that Margaret Mead's Samoa is largely make-believe. He encounters a puritanical people obsessed by rank, among whom aggression is commonplace. After collecting evidence for 40 years, he publishes his refutation of Mead's conclusions, an academic bombshell. The result is the greatest controversy in the history of anthropology, the science of humankind. A controversy that will be resolved by startling new evidence presented in this program. My mother, Margaret Mead, grew up in Pennsylvania in an academic household. Uh, her parents met as graduate students at the University of Chicago, 
and her father was a professor of economics, and her mother was a sociologist who never quite finished her PhD, but went on doing research even while she had four children. From the age of four, she was a very forceful, dominant person. She was told as a little child, repeatedly, apparently, that there is no one like Margaret, and this was a notion that she accepted and lived by all of her life. Indeed, there was no one like Margaret. She was always very, very sure of herself. She interested me uh, the more I looked into her because I think I began to understand the things that drove her because she was a driven woman as I see her. What do you think drove her then? I think there were a number of things. At first, I think the first thing is that she was a very plain girl and she never forgot that she was a very plain girl so that she had to overcompensate for being plain. Then um, she never really belonged. Her family kept moving when she was a child. So she was always the odd kid out at school. And she had this terrific need to be accepted, um, to feel that she belonged somewhere. All her life, Margaret Mead has been looking for a mentor. And at Columbia University, she finds Franz Boas, the father of American anthropology, and his assistant, Ruth Benedict. Ruth Benedict was an unhappily married woman who had uh, done a number of things but had never found fulfillment in any professional connection. She had written poetry and tried other avenues, but she had discovered anthropology and loved it and thought that this at last was the discipline she'd been looking for. And she said she wanted to have a companion in harness and in young Margaret Mead, a, an undergraduate studying the same discipline, she found that. And they became uh, very loving friends. I remember her as very beautiful and very, very gracious as a person. Now, when I came to write about my mother, uh, after her death, I learned that she had had an intimate relationship with Ruth for long periods of time. That was somehow enclosed within the friendship and the colleagueship. Her problem then became where should she go to uh, do the work that would lead to her dissertation? Well, an, an obvious answer would have been an American Indian tribe, but that had already been done. Everybody did that. Uh, many anthropologists, there, there were jokes that the average American Indian family consisted of mother, father, child, and anthropologist. So she wanted to go where, uh, where few people had gone before. For her first field trip, Margaret Mead's heart is set on some remote and beautiful South Sea island. Boas asks her to investigate a specific question, which he phrases, are the difficulties of adolescent girls due to the physiological changes which take place at puberty or to the civilization in which they grow up? Boas hopes that Margaret Mead's answer will help him in his battle with the eugenicists, those scientists who believe that the human race can be improved by selective breeding. This is the so-called nature versus nurture controversy, which rages during the 1920s and in which Mead herself is much involved. I didn't even want to study the adolescent girl. I wanted to study change. My professor wanted me to study adolescence. I wanted to come to Polynesia somewhere. He wanted me to stay in the United States. So we made an exchange. He said I could come to Polynesia if I'd study the adolescent girl. In August 1925, Margaret Mead departs for Samoa, leaving a young husband, Luther Cressman, waiting. Nobody pays special attention to Mead at the Ramshackle Hotel in Pango Pango, which Somerset Maugham has made famous, and for the next ten weeks she studies the Samoan language. She finds the main island too Americanized and decides to move to the small and remote island of Ta'u, one of three islands in the Manu'a group, 70 miles to the east. There she lives with an American family, the Holtz, at the naval dispensary. And it is from here that her study of 25 adolescent girls begins. 
Now, I did write, in a sense, for the Samoans. That is, I concealed every name of anyone about whose private life I said anything. And nobody's ever been able to work it out, thank goodness. Sometimes that makes them accuse me of things. But I concealed people's identity well enough. So when Dr. Holmes was there, he wrote me and said, I can't identify your informants. Please send me a list. Because um, I protected people enough so that I never uh, revealed the personality of anyone, the identity of anyone. One reason that Samoans do not have sexual problems, Mead reports, is that they never get deeply involved with their sexual partners. Sexual fidelity is rated as a matter of days or weeks at most. In fact, Mead claims, Samoans have no intense feelings about anything. There is no strong bond between parents and children, the society is not competitive, and no natural disasters threaten the people. Finally, at the end of her book, she concludes that the behaviour of the Samoans can be explained only in terms other than biological, thereby claiming the environment or nurture to be all important. She completes her study of Samoan adolescence in less than five months and in May 1926 departs for New York to publish her findings. I think the fascination of the book was its focus on sex, idealized sex, and America was at a stage where it was becoming sex-obsessed, and she catered really to that. L listen to this passage. Familiarity with sex and the recognition of a need of a technique to deal with sex as an art have produced a scheme of personal relations in which there are no neurotic pictures, no frigidity, no impotence except as a temporary result of severe illness and the capacity for intercourse only once in a night is counted as senility. I mean, who could possibly have fallen for that stuff? Mead's conclusion that adolescent behavior is culturally determined is big news for anthropology and very much what Boas wants to hear. The book becomes a triumph for his ideas and the American belief in human perfectibility. The enormous success of the book immediately thrusts Mead into prominence in American intellectual life, a position she will occupy for the next half century. Although she never again studies Samoa or revises her work, the die is cast. Before arriving in Samoa in 1940, Derek Freeman has already established a reputation as a radical among his fellow university students. When I was a student at uh, Victoria University College in Wellington, New Zealand, uh, I worked in the seminar of Ernst Beaglehoe, who was a personal friend of Margaret Mead's, and he introduced me to anthropology and to Margaret Mead's work and in particular uh, taught us that uh, this book, which was uh, then already well known, was of uh, great anthropological significance. Uh, Samoa was then an isolated place. Uh, it took 13 days by ship from New Zealand uh, to get there. And very sa few Samoans had been out of the islands. I had a horse and I used to ride over the mountains in the island to this remote village where I worked. Uh, and every available moment was spent studying the Samoans. During my first two years in Samoa, while I was learning the language, my base was in a village called Sa'anapu. And I stayed there with the family of the senior talking chief in this village. One morning, quite une unexpectedly, all of the chiefs of the village assembled and said that they were going to give me a, a, a title, an important title of the village. Uh, this title is Longona Itanga, which literally means heard at the tree felling, and it is the title of the heir apparent of the high chief of the village. At that time, I was quite young too, I was only 24. They bestowed that title. It took up all of my supplies, which I had to give to them, uh, supplies for a three-month stay. 
but from that time on, because I held this title, I was given recognition throughout the village, and I was had the right to sit in the Council of Chiefs, which I promptly did, and to attend all of their courts. And it was then that the information that was being brought unmistakably before me that I began to realize that many of the things that Margaret Mead had reported in coming of age in Samoa certainly did not accord with what I was witnessing in Sa'anapu. In 1943, Derek Freeman leaves Samoa to join the Navy. Later in the 1940s, he studies the Iban, a head-hunting people of central Borneo. He then becomes a professorial fellow at the Australian National University, and it is not until 1965 that he returns to Samoa for two years to continue his research. During the 1930s and over the next 40 years, Margaret Mead's reputation continues to grow. She becomes the recipient of numerous honorary degrees and awards. At some point in the 1960s, the world thrusts on Mead's shoulders what is described as a mantle of omniscience, which she accepts as her due and wears with a flourish. It goes well with her forked staff and cape and adds to her mystique as a superwoman who knows everything and who also, knowledge being power, can do anything. She becomes indisputably the most publicly celebrated scientist in America and one of the most revered women of all time. I knew Margaret very well um, for, I think, a period of 23 years. I, of course, did field work with her for several years in, in Manus, uh, in New Guinea. And uh, I was also part of her small group that she referred to as her family. Now, one thing Margaret was, she was an excellent lecturer, a fantastic entertainer and speaker. She really was an enchantress, and she could really cast a spell. She never failed to mesmerize me. Even after many years, I knew her. I would sit in the audience, and I'd watch her absolutely spellbound and wondered, how do you become like that? Absolutely incredibly gifted in this way. And I think that's what, I mean, after a while, it didn't matter what Margaret said. She said a lot of interesting things. She said a lot of very foolish things. And sometimes she gave the position of being avant-garde when she really wasn't avant-garde. Margaret Mead visited the Australian National University in 1964. And in November of that year, we had a long private meeting in my study in the Research School of Pacific Studies. I laid before her all of the evidence that I had that indicated that her conclusion was not empirically justified. She was very much taken aback by this and subsequently reported that, uh, that she felt that her results were now under threat. But when I wrote to her saying that although our conclusions differed, I hoped that there would be no bad feeling between us and that I would strive to see that there was not. She wrote back to me from New York in December 1964 saying, anyway, what matters is the work. And I thought that was an exemplary reply. My mother knew about Freeman, uh, the particular kind of personality he has, the fact that he has sometimes been somewhat unpredictable. And she was worried about it. She was worried that he might behave in a way that would be damaging to anthropology and damaging to the people of Samoa. You see, when you are dealing with a matter like this, Margaret Mead's conclusion in coming of age in summer had become established doctrine in universities throughout America. Now, I well realized that attempting to undo that was a very formidable task indeed, and I had to go about it most thoroughly. And it was only when I had assembled the evidence that I felt by March 1978 that I was... Uh, 
in a position to do it. But very soon after that, Margaret Mead unfortunately died. And I then realized that I, there must be a pause, there must be a decent pause between her death and the publication of the refutation. And I still, at any rate, had to seek certain evidence in Samoa and Honolulu. In 1981, at the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, Freeman completes the evidence for his refutation, and in 1982, he accepts an offer of publication by Harvard University Press. But before the book is released, Edwin McDowell, a journalist from the New York Times, picks up the story. The next thing I knew was that I was, one morning while I was having a bath here, the telephone rang, and I got up and went to the telephone unclad, I, quite naked, and there was Ewan McDowell on the telephone. I'd never heard of him before, and I talked to him for about 40 minutes. And on the 31st of January, it was on the front page of the New York Times. And then the furore began. The anthropologists were stunned by the New York Times article and stunned again by the immediate press attention to it. We're talking about uh, dispatches that were printed in literally hundreds of newspapers throughout the United States, not on one day, but for day after day. It had the kind of attention that presidential candidates or presidents are accustomed to have, altogether unusual for an academic subject. Uh, and they didn't have the book. Uh, they had no indication that such a book was in progress, and nor when it was announced had anybody heard of, of Derek Freeman. Who is Derek Freeman? And it looked like a case in which the, the uh, most honored anthropologist in history, indeed one of the most honored Americans and academics in history, was to be slain by an obscure David somewhere out in the, in the Antipodes. Uh, Coming of Age Samoa was a classic textbook for undergraduate teaching. Millions, who knows, five, ten million Americans may have read that as undergraduates in universities. And of course it was taught to them as being true. And then along comes Derek Freeman and says it's all false. What Derek did, you see, was, was a double whammy. He didn't just attack it in, in a theoretical way. He attacked it in the person of, of, the, of the goddess. Uh, of the super celebrity who had made anthropology, who was anthropology, was the symbol of anthropology to the world, and who was the prime promulgator of this doctrine uh, to the world on behalf of anthropology. So he, d he did a thing that was doubly bad. He didn't just say, you know, um, this religion is the theologically problematical. Um, he said, God is wrong. <laughs> or rather, in this case, the goddess is wrong. Uh, she couldn't be, you see. She couldn't be, because if she was wrong, then the doctrine was wrong, then the whole uh, liberal humanitarian scheme was wrong. Now, I think this is a wrong connection. I think the liberal wing here made a wrong connection. You don't, you don't need that position in order to defend uh, the, 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 uh, the goodness of man. But they do, and they did. One of the leading anthropologists came out immediately after the first word of Derek's book was out and said, I haven't read the book, but I know he's wrong. That's a bit depressing in a field that thinks it's a science. The controversy of nature nurture was an important one which should have been dealt with in his book, but wasn't dealt with because he was so interested in ruining the reputation that Margaret Mead had built on her Samoa work. I think that there was a kind of spirit of, oh boy, let's do some debunking. That'll be fun. That ended when people realized that this wasn't just Margaret Mead bashing. That this was an attack on the fundamental ideas of the discipline. I've had some anthropologists say to me that it wasn't good for the discipline as a whole. And I said, why not? Why not? If we can't stand scrutiny, then what are we worried about? I'm not worried about being scrutinized. Saying, yeah, so, well, that was wrong. So look at everything we've done right. This came at a time when there was a backlash on cultural determinism or explaining things in terms of environment in this country. It was a political backlash. Out comes this book, which supports a right-wing political backlash and gives reason why, in fact, we should be following biologically-based national policies. So that's extremely threatening. I'm not sure he was aware of that, that he 
was used or could have been used if his book had sold. Well, I'm a little concerned uh, as a university professor because my some of my students tell me that in their anthropology classes, they are almost actively discouraged from reading Freeman's book, which I find absolutely extraordinary. Because I have heard anthropology uh, colleagues uh, speak critically of Margaret Mead, but uh, it's as though they are frightened that their discipline will come under discredit by this book. And let's face it, I think they're a little nervous about getting grants. It so happened that in November 1983, in Science 83, which is a publication of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, my book was rated as the most important book of the year in the social sciences and recommended for holiday reading. Now, at this very time, the American Anthropological Association was meeting in Chicago, its annual meeting, and there the opposition to my refutation was so intense that a motion was passed condemning the book as unscientific and as possessing all other kinds of defects, and they then voted on it. This is a quite extraordinary event because the scientific truth is something that cannot be settled politically. It's something that depends on the evidence. And I realized when this news reached me that my refutation, in fact, had been a great success because it had prompted these people into this quite extraordinary reaction. American anthropologists knew very little about Derek Freeman as a person and didn't realize what they were taking on. Uh, I think they felt a few dismissive reviews and he would curl up and die and go away and retire back to Poga Poga or Bonga Bonga or wherever it was he'd come from. Uh, they didn't realize they were taking on a very, very tough character. I mean, uh, anyone who knows Derek knows uh, that when he has got his teeth into something, he does not let go. He is going to get it right though the heavens fall. Uh, so American anthropology suddenly found itself uh, with this, this one-man tornado uh, taking it on. And, and for every uh, 20 indignant letters or articles, the American anthropologists or speeches, Derek came back with 20 more equally powerful. Uh, and I think this has rather shaken them. I think they, they weren't prepared for something of this magnitude. They, they just thought he'd go away. Well, Derek doesn't just go away. In 1973, Richard Goodman, a student of Samoa for many years, writes his own independent refutation of Mead's book. He arrives at many of the same conclusions that Freeman reaches. Well, what I uncovered was that Samoans have a, a huge amount of aggression in them due to the way they're brought up as children, treated as children, punished as children, um, that they repress this aggression and anger, that they displace it. It comes out in, in very interesting and peculiar ways. Um, they, they simply aren't that happy. They have a mask of happiness. In the area in Samoa that I lived, there was uh, one occasion of extraordinary violence, which uh, happened in the national cricket tournament in Apia, in the capital city. Our team went to the cricket tournament, and they were not doing very well in the cricket tournament, and they thought they would, should be doing better. In one game, they became enraged by the referee's calls. They thought they were biased, and the crowd began yelling, kill the ref, and they did. They beat him to death with their cricket bats. Uh, one occurrence that I have read about um, in, I believe it was in 1928, a very similar occurrence happened in Apia in the National Cricket Tournament when uh, a referee was, was beaten to death by the players uh, with their cricket bats for bad calls, exactly the same thing that happened in 1982. When I was in Samoa in 1967, I was astonished to find that an American anthropologist, Lowell Holmes, had claimed that Mead's conclusions about Samoa were remarkably reliable. I had a copy of his uh, PhD thesis. In fact, he had sent me a copy of it. I then wrote to him and pointed out that the information contained in this thesis on rape and various other things directly contradicted Margaret Mead. 
And I asked him how this possibly could be, that when his own evidence contradicted her, he could claim that her conclusions were remarkably reliable. And he wrote back to me in 1967 saying that he agreed that Margaret found pretty much what she wanted to find and that he disagreed with various of her conclusions, but he was forced by his faculty advisor to soften his criticisms. And in this same letter, Holmes added, the only tragedy about Mead is that she still refuses to admit that she might have been wrong on her first field trip. Uh, it was this extraordinary confession of Holmes that was, among other things, as far as I was concerned, a quite important reason why I should proceed with my refutation. I don't believe that Margaret Mead was wrong on her first field trip. And the letter that I wrote to Derek Freeman, where he claims that I said that Margaret seems to find whatever she wants to, uh, is what I wrote him. This is true. At the time, however, Margaret had just written a very terrible review about a book of mine, and I was pretty upset at her. I wrote this to Derek Freeman. not believing that it would appear again and again and again in print. I thought this was confidential correspondence. And I still stand by it. And I've had four field trips to the area. And I still stand by my statement that I believe that her description of Samoan culture and Samoan behavior was very good. I believe that she did a very credible job. And I think that many of the complaints that, that uh, have been brought against her work by Derek Freeman are unfair. Since the publication of my refutation, Holmes has become Mead's principal champion. At the beginning of 1987, he published a book called The Quest for a Real Samoa Beyond the Mead Freeman Controversy. And in this book, he has evasively changed the conclusion that Mead reached. Dr. Holmes, how can you possibly still consider Mead's work to be correct in view of the so many contradictions between her work and yours? and even contradictions within Mead's book itself. I think that there are contradictions in Mead's book. I think that um, the society was perhaps a bit more complex than she pictured it. After all, this young woman was 23 years old. I think she probably made some mistakes. I think that she had perhaps a kind of a romantic view of the South Seas. Margaret Mead did distort the situation a little bit. Her picture of village life is a kind of a romantic one. What she did, she took typical activities that might occur throughout an entire year and sort of jammed them all into one day, giving the impression that a Samoan village is a very busy, bustling kind of place. I imagine this is a kind of artist license, and I don't know whether artist license is permitted anthropologists. I think that Coming of Age in Samoa was written for a popular audience. I think that the last chapter was um, added at the request of the publisher. I don't think that that necessarily affected the data that came before it, but I think that it may have affected some of the conclusions that she drew at the end. Well, Margaret Mead went into the field and she talked to adolescent girls and she came back with a view of Samoans as being gentle and uh, living an idyllic life of having uh, sex before marriage, as being able to try different things and not having the stresses and strains of American adolescence during the same period of life. Derek Freeman went in and he talked to the chiefs. And he came back with a view of uh, Samoan life as being aggressive and Samoans having a high rape rate and uh, 
ended up being almost the exact opposite of what Margaret Mead had described. And so you could argue that neither, that he was doing exactly what she was doing, except that he was 66 years old and she was 23 years old. He was doing what I call historical tracking. He was picking data out of different periods over long periods of time without concern for the changes that had happened during those uh, periods. Not only the changes in terms of the Americans that were coming and going, but the moderniz modernization, the technology that was coming in, the schooling and how that was affecting people. Uh, it was all as if it were one period for him. From what I have seen in Western Samoa and the people that I've talked to and what I've read uh, about the debate, I don't see any significant difference uh, in the society and the people's behavior uh, in 1928 between Western Samoa and Tau. According to Mead, adolescence in Samoa is a period of promiscuity before marriage. Freedom of sexual experimentation is encouraged and even expected, with a girl distributing her favors among many youths adept in amorous techniques. But all other ethnographers report that both premarital and extramarital sex are strictly prohibited by Samoan custom. They describe the Samoans as a devoutly Christian people with a very severe sexual morality that was even stronger during Mead's time in Samoa. How then is Mead's account of free love in Samoa to be explained? There's a, a double standard in Samoa. The young men have two objects. One of them is to have sexual relations with the, the girls as much as they can. The other one is to make sure their sisters don't have sexual relations with the other guys in the village. And um, a girl leads a very guarded, protected life. Aside from just opinions of various people who were there or not, I find it extraordinary that, that people don't mention uh, what Margaret Mead just passed off in her book is that there were no pregnancies, which she admits in, in her book. None of these girls that she claims are engaging in sex ever got pregnant. And I find that to be extraordinary. In fact, she doesn't uh, document any premarital uh, pregnancies in any of the villages that she worked in. And I can't imagine that young girls who are, who are presumably fertile, that she documents their fertility essentially in her book, that they weren't getting pregnant. And if they don't, I assume that there wasn't sex going on. Could Margaret Mead have allowed herself to be fooled by the Samoan girls, on whom she relied completely for information? Put yourself in the position of a teenage girl in an American colony which has been heavily Christianized by somewhat puritanical missionaries. And you know what puritanical missionaries are mostly concerned with. Once they got rid of headhunting, they want to get rid of anything like promiscuous sex or extramarital sex. Put yourself in the position of those teenage girls, and you have this rather ambiguous American woman ambiguous in the political sense that she's hobnobbing both with government officials and with missionaries and then she's trying to make cozy friends with you and then starts asking you about your men arc and about your boyfriends and about how you get engaged and what do you do when you go in the bushes i think you're just setting yourself up in any society but surely in a society like that you're setting yourself up for people telling you what they think you want to hear what comes through for me as I read over the material is the kind of warm, informal, day after day relationship that she had with those teenage girls. I think the idea of a systematic, sustained distortion is extremely implausible. One of the main forms of entertainment in a Samoan village is what I call recreational line, which has several terms, and it's the old pulling people's legs, pimping people. It's, it's a basic sort of locker room humor from junior high school. All ages engage in it, and people tell you stories to try and get you to believe it, and then they sort of chuckle inside, and it happens continually. My friends used to do this to me all the time, um, and often... It's about sexual matters because they're very, some ones appear to me to be very uptight about sex and that's the thing that, that always brings a laugh. They, they say things about sex that, that they don't mean. Perhaps in this controversy, the Samoans themselves hold the answer and their evidence is of crucial significance. 
Well, I went to the University of Hawaii in 1948 to take some courses in the University of Hawaii. And it was during an anthropology class that I, I realized something was being taught that was not in accordance with our way of life and culture. And during this anthropology class, I got up and objected to Professor Mason, who was the instructor, told him I do not believe, and I did not believe at that time, to what Margaret Mead was saying in her book about the sex life of the Samoan young people. And he said to me, how do you know? And he said, well, I should know. I grew up in that culture. I am of the age Margaret Mead is writing about. And that is not true. Margaret Mead was in here in 1926. So she stayed at Mrs. Guest House as one of the chiefs over here. I usually help her with carrying her mosquito net, typewriters, and some folders for her work. I think some, some girl told her the wrong story. Yeah, some on people, you know, once they want to laugh to a, a foreigner or somebody, so they told them the, the wrong story to influence her to listen to the story, but, but, but it's not a true story. Ta'u Island, the very place where Margaret Mead studied adolescence in Samoa. A terrible hurricane devastated the island in 1987. Remarkably, a search for Mead's adolescent girls of the 1920s leads to the discovery, more than 60 years later, of Mead's close associate and chief informant, 86-year-old Fa'apua'a Fa'amu. Her account will settle once and for all the controversy that has long surrounded Margaret Mead's coming of age in Samoa. Well, if Margaret Mead was wrong, where do you think she got her ideas from? Do you think she was fooled by her young informants? No, my, my view, and this may be a bit um, <laughs> harsh, but I think Margaret Mead was talking about her own self. I think she brought her own ideas. She was just looking for a frame. But she brought her own ideas and her own problems from the United States of America and from her own self. I think she made up her mind that she's going to write that theory according to what she believed, but not according to what the people are living here. 
because the whole book is just totally opposing our own custom and culture, the way we live, the way we protect our young girls. Margaret Mead took away our, perhaps not our humanity so much, as our, our oneness with other human beings. I mean, we are, we are no different from you in Australia or the United States or any other part of the world. We all go through these phases. And um, perhaps it's our cultures that makes the, uh, the, the, the semblance of difference. But for Margaret Mead to, to make us um, behave as if, we, as if we are non-humans because we, we behave like animals in um, our promiscuity, I think that is a very uh, great uh, disfavor that she has done us. We have one more question from Saini. Uh, yes, Dr. Mead. I would like to ask you, why did you choose to visit Samoa at this time, not, let's say, five or ten years right after you wrote the book 46 years ago? Well, I think the, the real answer is, you know, that well, there are two or three answers. One, lots of other people came to work in Samoa. Younger students, and they, they came to talk to me before they went, and I talked to them when they came back. We began having moving pictures, so that I saw pictures every few years, I, lots of still pictures. I knew what was happening, you know. I've seen pictures of what's been going on in Tau for years. I find it very curious that Margaret Mead never really returned uh, to Samoa. Apparently she once sat down there for an hour or so to open a power station or something. But she went back to other places to recheck what had happened, but never to Samoa. And I think this is very curious. My own hypothesis is that she was frightened, that she was frightened that she might find material that contradicted her first book. And after all, her fame was established by that first book. And I think she was so insecure that she was afraid that if anything in that book was discredited, her whole reputation would fall into shreds. She told me that uh, she had met with Derek Freeman and that he had told her about his research in Samoa and what he thought of her work and that he was going to publish this. And uh, I, I gave her a so what look. <laughs> and she said, uh, you don't understand, he has proven me wrong. And she looked very sad and puzzled and uh, I thought it was very odd that I was here feeling sorry for Margaret Mead and even stranger that I was going to have to tell her that this was not important, but I did. I said, You're, what you have done in anthropology and for the world is not Samoa dependent. It really doesn't matter whether you were right or wrong about Samoa. And uh, she said, well, what do you think uh, I ought to do about it? I said, just nothing. Well, uh, as a result of this whole controversy, Samoa is a place that has assumed immense anthropological and human significance. I have often said that if only we Westerners can understand the Samoans, then we can understand ourselves. And we should be thankful that Samoa was a place where issues of such great scientific importance could be studied and resolved. Samoa is a profoundly important place to me. I mean, that's where I began to think deeply about these problems. And I have an enormous debt of gratitude to the Samoans. I become very emotional when I go to Samoa because my bond with the Samoans is so deep and I have a, a great love and regard for them. But this does not mean to say that I suppose that they are stainless or that they are gods or goddesses. They are marvelous human beings. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs>
in life is that we will develop a genuine science of the human species. Nothing is more important for humans than that we succeed in that task. Now, I have said that the question that Bowers gave Margaret Mead to answer was a profoundly important anthropological question. And I think that now in the late 1980s we have resolved that problem. It is apparent to all knowledgeable behavioral scientists that we must operate within a framework in which we simultaneously take into account our evolutionary history and our cultures. And it is only when these two things are combined within an interactionist paradigm that you have the imperative precondition for a genuine science of our species. Well, I, I have always been a heretic. Uh, I think being a heretic is the most beautiful thing because this, this comes from a Greek root, meaning someone who chooses for himself. In other words, a heretic is someone who thinks for himself and doesn't run with the mob. And I have always been a heretic and found great joy in it. But what you've got to be in science is a heretic who gets it right. There's no use being a heretic who gets it wrong because then you're a pariah dog in their eyes. But if you are a heretic who gets it right, you can't do better. Okay, well, let's get back uh, to our slide. All right, so this this controversy, like as you've seen, it it's, it's very important. Not only, it was something on in the public sphere and across academia. And when, when you take theory and anthropology is still one of the most debated topics um, to, you know, to, to cover. So we cover this extensively. Um, now let's, let's go through the, the differences. So in this film, they interview one of her informants. And what it, what she reveals is that they lie to Margaret Mead, which is basically what Friedman states in his book. Um, they, they, he presents her as uh, being um, seeking out this information and being lied to by these girls. So therefore, it was, it was kind of she was uh, duped, um, and she thought she found this information. Now, um, what was wrong with Margaret Mead's book? and her work at the time. Well, one of the things is that, of course, you know, again, going back to what was going on in, in the late 20s and the 30s, uh, she set out to address this debate of uh, nature versus nurture. And remember, at this time, eugenics, uh, idea of race was very strong, and we're, and they were using science to actually try to create a perfect human or improve humanity and so forth. So when Mead, when Mead brings back this information, she presents this as a cultural determinism, that she is going on the opposite scale, saying that it is not nature, it is nurture, it's your environment and so forth. So in that sense, we know now that 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 is not um, correct. Uh, it's it's not one or the other. One supersedes the other. It's a combination of both, um, and it, they're they're 
they have uh, a lot of influence. Uh, the culture has a lot of influence and in how and how we view reality and how we deal with situations. Um, but there's also um, there's also changes, uh, hormonal changes that take place uh, during adolescence um, that bring about these um, these discomforts and 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 situations. However, in this controversy, um, what what it reveals, uh, Friedman came back and revealed completely the opposite. He presented Samoa's. Uh, not as a calm, uh, relaxed culture, um, very free with, with with girls having a lot of freedom. He comes back and he presents quite the opposite: that they are violent, uh, that there's aggression, um, that they're a bit puritanical, that they they have this almost a, a view of of sexuality as almost taboo. Now here is where, after all this. You know, going back and forth, there was uh, many academics that went out and and re-studied Freeman and so forth. Um, here's what it it comes down to. One is the time that the re-study was done. It was done years later, many years later, almost almost uh, forty years later, after after Mead was there. Um, second. It, Mead was a young 23-year-old girl when she conducted the study, therefore she had access to teenagers. Friedman, being a male and achieving a high-ranking status, you have to question, would he be able to interview um, young teenage girls? And would they reveal this information? So this brings about this reflection and understanding and anthropology, questioning, you know, bringing about a reflection of the experience and who you have access to um, based on the time of the study. The other, the other debate that comes on to play is this idea where Friedman goes back years later, not only taking into account uh, the gender uh, roles um, and how and his social status within the community when he's conducting these interviews, um, but also this assumption that culture is stagnant, this assumption that when he would go back um, almost 40 years later and assume that he finds uh, this culture the, exactly the same as Margaret Mead found it. And therefore, this, this idea that culture is stagnant is also incorrect. So the last, uh, the last debate that, um, that other academics have found in that last interview, the last informant um, that they present there, uh, this informant uh, was a daughter of a high-ranking official. Now, in, free, in Mead's work, she does present that she interviewed over 20 girls and she does make note that high ranking that the daughters of high ranking officials um their virginity is highly valued so they they have uh this title um for virgins uh within their within their society and within this whole you know almost 50 50 some year difference a lot has changed in this in this society um the ex you know, expansion of Christianity, changes in ideas and behavior and traditions take place. So this, um, this book was heavily debated in thinking that culture is stagnant. Uh, but this, again, was an ongoing debate, and it was finally settled um, with one, one article brings about this uses a film as a metaphor to settling this debate. And this film, I'll play for it, we have time, I'll play for it, I'll play it for you, sorry. Uh, it's a metaphor for presenting the complexities of ethnography. In other words, what um, ethnographies must be understood um, based on the period of time when they take place. Uh, we know now that culture is not stagnant. We know now that 
it is um, this debate of while it still comes up again and again, we have found this balance within this debate of, of nature versus nurture. So one does not supersede the other. Um, also, what the anthropologist uh, has access to when conducting um, their, their study question is very important. Uh, for example, there were um, many, many times where I, as a woman, was not allowed uh, to get near a ceremonial site among the Mayas because of this idea that um, women have a cold energy because we are made from the moon versus males that, ha that harness heat uh, because they come from the sun. And, and in many occasions, I was not allowed uh, to get near, um, near certain offerings or, um, or where they were about to conduct a uh, fire because my energy, my presence there uh, could affect it. And so we have to understand what, what role we play, um, how we're viewed when we are conducting interviews. And what I would do in this case is send my husband with my questions and, and my camera uh, to, approach, um, to approach this ceremony or this ritual and document this for me. Um, so being able to understand uh, the ethnographers, uh, what, what access to the culture the ethnographer has, uh, what are the experiences that that they are that they are living, um, what time frame, what is going on at the time, what stressors or perhaps um, changes are are taking place at this point in time is very important, and to also consider that culture is constantly changing, the introduction of technology, the introduction of new belief systems. Um, Im immigration is always taking place and this is always constantly changing societies and people's way of lives. So in this film, uh, this, this, um, this author finally says, you know, the way to settle this Margaret Fried Friedman debate um, in academia is to take into account the Rashomon effect. And this is uh, from, this is a Japanese film and here the filmmaker presents, um, presents three characters, the bandit, the samurai, and, and samurai's wife. And the samurai wife, the wife dies, but she is able to communicate through a spirit medium. And the whole film is, he uses shadows, he uses uh, angles, he uses uh, perception to point out all three characters, their point of view of what happened at what happened at, at this in this incident during you know in the forest and the conclusion as opposed to um as opposed to how we view films here in the US where the hero always wins or where the truth comes out um in this film does leaves the viewer with an unresolved truth and he presents this film as a metaphor, as the film itself reflects, is that it, it, there is, it's difficult to find the, a final absolute truth because there are different perspectives. And where, where the characters are standing um, within the forest uh, has a lot to do with what, how they view um, and what takes place in the forest. Um, so for this, it leaves us with a reflection in anthropology, again, that culture is always changing and that we must understand each study and within the studies that we conduct, we must take into account the experiences, the methodologies and what um, that are being used at the time and what we have access to. Um, and this is why it must be very clearly disclosed um, when you're conducting these studies. I'll, I'll play the film in a second. I'll leave you with the end of the film. And from this debate, 
emerged um, in anthropology to establish a code of ethics in, in the 70s. And from this, it, things were already taking place in anthropology. Anthropologists um, in the 60s in the 60s and the 70s were also being hired by the government um, to try to study the, the enemy's behavior patterns, uh, especially during World War II. And therefore, anthropologists and their work and their integration to cultures and their, their ability to study other cultures based on even from afar using newspapers, um, and and video collection and so forth. Uh, this brought about a debate in this field, um, and it brought about a debate on you know our ethics and and to ensure that we do not um, harm anybody, that we must ensure the safety of the people that we are working with, and also their privacy. So in many cases, it is very, it is, um, if the informants um, do prefer not to have their name published, it, that is completely acceptable. Um, there's, as I presented in other, in other studies in, at the beginning when looking at cultural anthropology, uh, anthropologists have done work among, you know, the mafia, among, um, among rebellious groups. Um, among groups that are, you know, being targeted. And, and in, in this case, it's very important to protect their identities and to make sure that the work and the research that we conduct uh, brings no harm um, to the people that we are working with. Okay, so I'll leave you with this film as, uh, as an example of a metaphor uh, to studying anthropology to always take into account the ethnographer's experience, the, the methodologies uh, that, are being, that are being used, and what is, what is, what is taking place in, in that time. And to always remember that culture is always changing. It's never stagnant. Here we go. As I'm in the midst of applying for residency right now, wish me luck, Grammarly has again been a lifesaver with my application and helping me write my personal statement. The samurai is found dead in a quiet bamboo grove. One by one, the crime's only known witnesses recount their version of the events that transpired. But as they each tell their tale, it becomes clear that every testimony is plausible, yet different, and each witness implicates themselves. This is the premise of Inner Grove, a short story published in the early 1920s by Japanese author Ryunosuke Akutagawa. Though many know this tale of warring perspectives by a different name, Rashomon. In 1950, Japanese filmmaker Akira Kurosawa adapted two of Akutagawa's stories into one film. This movie introduced the world to an enduring cultural metaphor that has transformed our understanding of truth, justice, and human memory. The Rashomon effect describes a situation in which individuals give significantly different but equally conceivable accounts of the same event. Often used to highlight the unreliability of eyewitnesses, the Rashomon effect usually occurs under two specific conditions. The first, there's no evidence to verify what really happened. And the second, there's pressure to achieve closure, often provided by an authority figure trying to identify the definitive truth. But the Rashomon effect undermines the very idea of a singular, objective truth. In the source material, Akutagawa and Kurosawa use the tools of their media to give each character's testimony equal weight, transforming each witness into an unreliable narrator. Without any hints on who's sharing the most accurate account, the audience can't tell which character to trust. 
Instead, each testimony takes on a truthful quality, and the audience is left doubting their convictions as they guess who ended the samurai's life. Some might find this frustrating, because the plot subverts expectations of how mysteries usually end. But by refusing to provide a clear answer, these two artists capture the messiness and complexity of truth and human memory. Neuroscientists have found that when we form a memory, our interpretation of visual information is influenced by our previous experiences and internal biases. Some of these biases are unique to individuals, but others are more universal. For example, egocentric bias can influence people to subconsciously reshape their memories in ways that cast a positive light on their actions. Even if we were able to encode a memory accurately, recalling it incorporates new information that changes the memory. And when we later recall that event, we typically remember the embellished memory instead of the original experience. These underlying psychological phenomena mean that the Rashomon effect can pop up anywhere. In biology, scientists starting from the same data set and applying the same analytical methods frequently publish different results. Anthropologists regularly grapple with the impact personal backgrounds can have on an expert's perception. In one famous case, two anthropologists visited the Mexican village of Tepotzlan. The first researcher described life in the town as happy and contented, while the second recorded residents as paranoid and disgruntled. Experts aside, the Rashomon effect can also impact the general public, particularly when it comes to the perception of complicated world events. For example, following a 2015 security summit between the United States and leaders from the Arab states, media reports about the summit varied enormously. Some stated that it had gone smoothly, while others called it a complete failure. It's tempting to fixate on why we have competing perceptions. But perhaps the more important question the Rashomon effect raises is, what is truth anyway? Are there situations when an objective truth doesn't exist? What can different versions of the same event tell us about the time, place and people involved? And how can we make group decisions if we're all working with different information, backgrounds and biases? Like most questions, these don't have a definitive answer. But the enduring importance of Akutagawa's story suggests there may be value in embracing the ambiguity. When it comes to determining the truth, what's more reliable, ambiguity or unanimity? Strangely enough, sometimes the closer you get to total agreement, the less trustworthy a result becomes. Unpack the counterintuitive paradox of unanimity with this video. All right, so we'll leave it there. Um, and therefore, this, this, uh, this video uh, presented the Margaret, the Margaret Mead and David, David um, Friedman controversy. Um, and it just presents um, what, how our understanding, our now uh, reflection and understanding of uh, the complexities of, eth of doing ethnographic work and how we always must take into account uh, the perspectives and the experiences. Okay, if you have any questions, just send me an email. Thank you.